Thanks for staying up later. Our guest tonight is ABC's H. Jeff Greenfield. Now, I'm walking. I make note. Yes, indeed, I'm he's walking. Me and Ray Handley. I'm out of here. This interview's <laughs> over. You had to do that, huh? I bring it up because you brought it up yourself in a recent column yeah. when uh, Harkin was making a big deal out of uh, George Herbert Walker Bush right. and Jay Danforth Quayle. Right. And now Mario Cuomo seems uh, offended by the use of his first name. Yeah. And you happen to be H. Jeff Greenfield. Well, I was noting that, that uh, I thought any politician who made fun of a potential rival's name was courting disaster because there are millions and millions of people walking around this country with middle names that they don't reveal to their spouses. And as it happens, because of the way uh, I was named, my real first name, legal first name, is Henry. Because my grandfather had died before I was born, that is the tradition. So I've had to go through life a lot of times with driver's licenses or credit cards or whatever that say H. Jeff Greenfield, which makes me sound like I'm competing in the Gentile for a Day contest. And I was simply <laughs> warning Harkin that, that he might want to ease up on George Herbert Walker Bush lest he, he lose a lot of votes. Well, the obvious intent here is Harkin the populist right. trying to make a point that all these Republican guys are a bunch of guys on a yacht. Absolutely. They're all these preppy patrician you guys. Bet. You bet. Drinking Chablis and nibbling Brie. And, and the counterweight is, I mean, this is one of the great battles in, in American politics. Uh, so I'm glad you asked that question, as politicians say when you show right. them their tax returns. It's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a constant that no politician wants to think of himself as well-born. Um, and so George Bush, you remember, in 1988 made much of the fact that he, his favorite snack was pork rinds and he was a devotee of country music. And during the New Hampshire primary, when he'd been battered in Iowa, and he was trying to show he's a regular guy, he was driving trucks and wearing John Deere caps, and generally, and we're gonna see this again. Um, it's one of those, uh, th Jimmy Carter with the garment bag that he always carried himself. Uh, it, it's a very venerable, uh, semi-amusing American political tradition. Um, once I wanna see a candidate say, you know, my father was filthy rich, I was given the best of everything, and that means I don't have to steal. <laughs> it means that I have a good education and can think, but we're not going to see that. What was your take on Mario Cuomo being affronted by a quail calling him Mario? Well, my own feeling was it showed that, that he, for all of his skill, and he is one of the most skillful uh, debaters, arguers there, that there are, uh, he's amazing, is that he hadn't he hadn't thought this through enough. I mean, the way you handle a thing like that, because it is essentially trivial, is you as the potential candidate never get up and get affronted. Well, if Mario decides to run, uh, it will be a good uh, Democratic uh, primary campaign first. I can't imagine the Democratic uh, challengers out there to uh, the president are going to just roll over and play dead just because Mario decides to enter the uh, presidential race. You laugh it off. But you find 20 friends of yours with various names to indicate different mm -hmm. ethnic groups to get up and, and pound their chest indignantly. And then when they ask you about it, you say, my concern isn't that Dan Quayle called me Mario. My concern is that the Bush administration has sent tens of millions of working class people into starvation and privation. You always, you want to see that issue out there, but you never want to put it out yourself because it seems testy. If they were deliberately trying to get at ethnicity, that would surprise me because it's stupid. If they were kind of making a clumsy, poor joke, that wouldn't surprise me because they do that all the time. Now, the new wisdom is that Bush, who looked absolutely unbeatable only several months ago, right. might be taken. It's not 50-50, yeah. but neither is it off the board. Do you agree with that, or is that too optimistic for the Democrats? No, because you put it in a, in a safe enough way that it's almost impossible to disagree. You could be a very good political analyst. Uh, <laughs> it's mealy-mouthed enough to, you know... <laughs> Thank you so much. ...worthy of meet the press. Well, that's I, all I, right. I pride myself on that facility. <laughs> well, we're all very proud of you. Thank you. Uh, join the ranks. Uh, no, that's what, what's happened is that Bush has become, it's become a competitive race. But Bush has one tremendous asset. He gets to run against the Democratic Party. And in contemporary American politics, by which I mean the last quarter century, the, the, the truth is that in, a, in a, any given presidential election, you have to bet on the Republicans. Now, it's complicated. It has to do with the, the shift of the South to a solid Republican base, the fact that most of the Democratic Party's coalition has fractured They've moved from the city to the suburbs, Frost Belt to Sun Belt. They've lost a lot of blue-collar voters on social values. The last Democratic president did not do a stellar job on the economy. So they've got a problem in general. And uh, every four years, the Democrats say, you know, we've we got to do this differently. 
we got to refine our message. And then every four years, they seem to run a candidate who gets right into the buzzsaw. So if you're putting money on this, uh, you still have to bet on, on Bush. But he is definitely beatable. And if I may, he is beatable for the same reason he has always been potentially beatable, which is now the revealed wisdom. He does not have a strong political message. Never did. In your view, who's the most potentially effective Democratic candidate? How about 92? them chats, Bob? <laughs> um, could, I, I do need to backtrack on that. The, I'll tell you this. As of now, the guy who has been getting the rave notices out there, well, actually, there are two. Bill Clinton uh, keeps getting this, the, the political press to write, he went to a place where they weren't supposed to like him, like the Chicago you know, Democrats who were old-fashioned, mm -hmm. and wowed him with a very con detailed message about reform. Tom Harkin is wowing them on the other message, uh, the old-time religion message. Uh, be proud to be a Democrat. Let's get those rich folks. Those two guys have emerged as the people with, um, with the most instant, um, they're striking sparks with an audience. But I think, I think right now Clinton is in the, the best shape. I refuse to be part of a generation of Americans that celebrates the death of communism abroad with the loss of the American dream here at home. I think the Democratic Party is once again going to run the same fight it ran in 84 between the old-fashioned Democrats, in that case Mondale, and, and people who are saying the party's got to refine and really radically change its message. Uh, Gary Hart seemed to be saying that in 84. And I think Bill Clinton has a much more detailed sense of that. And then it's up to the Democratic Party voters as to which way they go. If Cuomo gets in, he's going to be the traditionalist. He and Harkin will fight for that base. And Bob Kerry and Paul Songus and Bill Clinton will fight for the revisionist base. And, and you can see how that's going to go. Harkin will accuse Clinton of being a neo-Republican. And Clinton will say, no, you guys are out of date. And that's how it'll go. It's almost universally believed that the state of especially national campaigns, local mm. campaigns as well, but especially national campaigns, has never been worse. Right. No real intellectual discussion of the issues, all kinds of attempts to define your opponent mm -hmm. in, in often disingenuous, if not outright dishonest ways. Yeah. How can the media combat that? If these guys aren't going to be up front themselves, how can the media force them in that direction? Well, this, you're going you're to see the answer to that for, I mean, you're going to see attempted answers to that very soon. Because all the, the, the three major broadcast networks uh, have all uh, spent a lot of time trying to figure out why things went so wrong in 88, how we let the, pol the political handlers take control of the agenda. And the networks independently have all asserted, uh, and Tim Russert here at NBC has been absolutely outspoken in this, that, that the networks all plan to try to take the agenda back, to, to do serious polling, and instead of using the polls to show that, uh, you know, Dithers is leading Smithers by 22 points among left-handed dentists to say what, what are the five things that are, that are most on the minds of American voters and citizens and then really probe to see what the candidates have to say or not say about it. It's going to make this campaign year, this is one prediction I'll flat out make, very testy because people who are used to running campaigns in which they make issues out of whatever they choose to are going to find a much more skeptical press and I'll predict to you and you that uh, you're going to hear a lot of handlers saying, who elected these guys to decide what the issues mm -hmm. are? We are the candidates. What should the debate formats be, ideally? Well, I actually have had an idea that I, uh, that I raise every four years to widespread indifference. And one of my ideas is that, I mean, I used to be a political handler before I became a virgin. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you probably, these guys know what's coming. I mean, because they're as, at least as smart as the journalists and probably smarter. They get paid a lot more. Uh, and so you can pretty well game out any question that's going to come, you know, Senator, Social Security, blah, 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 all right? And, and you sort of plug in the tape. So my first idea <clears throat> was to really see how smart these guys were. My plan, this is one of the reasons I will never moderate a debate, uh, was to, I'd have the candidates, and I'd say, okay, here's a, pa here's a paper, here's a pencil, all right? A train leaves New York at 8 o'clock in the morning going 80 miles an hour. Another train leaves Chicago at noon going 60. When do the two trains meet, and how much should Amtrak be subsidized? Now, to me, that's the kind of question that will force these guys, will actually see how smart they are, at least at math. Uh, nobody likes that idea. Uh, <laughs> however, 
I do like the notion Didn't that... Didn't we the, all do that on the Iowa test of basic educational skills? Uh, could be, could be. Uh, I also had proposed giving the candidates a Minnesota multifacet personality inventory, but, you know, that's the test to see if they're... They're not going to do that either. However... Would you like to have them, like, do a Rorschach yeah, test? exactly. On exactly. national that's television? Exactly right. What Live. does this blob right. remind you of? Right, right. And Jesse Helms would tell us it was a dirty picture. Um, the other thing is, I, I have more seriously suggested, I'd like to hear these guys answer questions that are not so formal. I mean, not the flip one that I suggested. I'd like to ask these guys, when were they most afraid in their lives? And what, what, are, what did they learn from that? What change in the country in the last 20 years, right off the bat, has been most beneficial, most malignant? Um, because they rehearse everything. If you ask these guys, what books do you read? And you think you're you know, breaking through the curtain? They have handlers who tell them what books they should have read. Didn't, I think it was Bernard Shaw who tried to do that well, in 88. He posed the one question which he tried to personalize to Dukakis. Right. What if Kitty Dukakis were raped? What would your personal reaction be? And, of right. course, Dukakis's way of handling that was so cold and, and disengaged. And it revealed something. That, that it, it revealed something and it hurt him. That's right. I think he also asked in the vice presidential debate, it might not have been Bernard, it seems to me it was, doesn't matter. The question was asked, what was the last book you read or a book you read that had the most impact on your life and then also a person yeah, Broca, who had the most impact Broca on your life. Broca asked them, uh, what piece of advice did you get or from anyone who most changed your life? And it was Quayle, uh, I mean, given his life, you know, he said that uh, his grandma right. had said to him that you can be anything you want to be if you just set your mind to it. And I was real tempted, because I was the only ABC correspondent there, to, to tell the audience that, that I've never forgotten the advice that my grandma gave me, which is it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich girl as a poor girl. Uh, <laughs> but once again, you know, you, you don't play those games on national television. All right, let me turn the tables on you. I have a list of some of your proposed questions. Oh, okay. I'll ask them of you. Okay. Give me a, a favorite line from a poem or a song that means something to you. Mm. And you would ask this of a presidential oh, yeah, yeah. candidate. Box of Rain from the Grateful Dead. Such a, such, a, such a long, long time to be gone and a short time to be here. Lots of wisdom in that. What's the most exciting event you ever witnessed? Uh, the first Ali Fraser fight. I thought I was going to drop dead of excitement. I never have been in an arena with a sheer, almost animal-like excitement at being at this event was higher. They carried two people out of that dead of heart attacks, by the way. I mean, so it was not imagined. But when that bell rang... I've never been in an arena like that in my life, or any other place. But now suppose you were a presidential candidate, yeah. right? Yeah. And that was your honest answer, and right. it's what came to you from the gut, That's what you and you do. gave it. Oh, I think people would go, yeah, I believe that. That sounds right. I mean, because one of the biggest mistakes, I used, you know... But handlers would say, don't say well, that. But, you know, that's, it's not presidential that's enough. Why some, that's why the really smart politicians go on home instinct. I mean, for all, that, uh, for all the criticism about Reagan, he had a great sense of at some fundamental level of who he was and what he believed. Now, he took delegation <laughs> to perhaps an extreme, but, but he knew. That's why in the 1980 debate when he said, I'm paying for this microphone, yeah, it was a line Spencer Tracy spoke in State of the Union, but nobody gave him that line. At least I don't think so. I really don't. I think that was Reagan going, yeah, I'm in this moment. I know what I think. Okay, again from the list. When were you most afraid in your life? Um, well, it's actually, it's not that interesting. I was, I was momentarily on vacation many years ago, swept away by an undertow in Puerto Rico, and for about five or ten seconds thought I was going to drown. Okay, now I'm the moderator or panelist, however yeah. it's set up. The natural follow-up would be, yeah. if I'm paying attention, cite for me when you were most afraid yeah. when the danger was not physical. Well, that, okay, that becomes uh, an even more interesting psychological question. Um, and, uh, you know, the problem with that is for a lot of people, it might be intensely personal, too personal to answer honestly, because that's another area. I mean, do you want to talk about a guy who, who, um, um, you know, who went through a terrible uh, personal tragedy with one of his parents, discovered his father was an alcoholic, or that his mother uh, had, com you know, had done something terrible, and he was, I mean, there, there's a reasonable ground for saying, well, there are some questions that I might want to know that I shouldn't know. Back with Jeff Greenfield of ABC News. You were guest hosting Nightline the night that Nina Totenberg went at it with Alan Simpson. Mm -hmm. Paul Simon was also a guest on the show, but he wasn't involved in the head-to-head. -head. Well, unfortunately for me, the, the real excitement took place uh, 200 miles away after the show. 
it was uh, the, the Monday night when the Clarence Thomas vote was put off and we knew we were heading into this really contentious uh, debate. And Nina Totenberg had, was one of the two reporters who had broken the story. And Alan Simpson on the air, uh, in effect, not in effect, said, you know, you're not an objective and honest reporter about this. What politicians get tired of is bias in reporters. You've been beating the drum on this one almost every day since it started in the most extraordinary way. Let's not pretend you're objective in here. That just would be absurd. Nina uh, said just as forcefully that she did not appreciate having her objectivity question that she was reporting legitimate news. Senator, you she came up to me. people, may she came I, up to I people respond? and well, said, Senator, you and said me, may excuse I me, I'm not being mean, I'm being truthful. Senator, I have the I, affidavit, Senator, please. Senator, let, me give Nina, let me give Nina Totenberg a brief response. Go ahead. I'd like to get I a get word in, too. I, 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 after I the break. Too, I, too, don't want to be the messenger who's blamed. All I do is report. I don't know who's telling the truth here. There are inconsistencies on all sides. That's right. But I do know that I do not appreciate being blamed just because I do my job and report the news. I don't Excuse care. Me, you know, Senator, I didn't ask yeah. you to Senator, appreciate. I'm asking yeah. you about affidavits. Senators, this is force majeure. I'm going to give Senator Fine. Simon a chance do to it. get in. You're I'm right. going to give you a chance. We'll right. give everybody a chance within the limits of commercial Let's television when we continue our discussion in a Great. moment. Now, after the show was over, I was in New York. They were in Washington. The two of them went out into the street outside the ABC offices. Uh, my understanding is the senator held the door open for uh, Nina Totenberg and in effect said to her, uh, I really meant what I said about that, Nina. And Nina then made several suggestions to the senator. Well, didn't he say subsequently on the, uh, the Nightline town meeting, she dropped the F-bomb on me three or four times? I was not times. personal witness, but I do believe that uh, many references uh, to Anglo-Saxon words were heard in the streets of Washington. Yes, it was not. It was a frank and open exchange of views, as the uh, diplomats say. Yeah, they, they were. That was a whole period, though, when the whole Clarence Thomas and Nita Hill situation was one in which there was more ill will than I can between uh, competing po political forces with between politicians and the press. I mean, normally there's a level of collegiality here. You fight it out. And this one. I was, I was down in Washington when the vote was going on, and it was bilious. I mean, the exchanges between Ted Kennedy and uh, Arlen Specter, particularly, were really unusual in a place like the Senate, where personal relations are very important mm -hmm. to, to maintain. There was, I think it was a combination of, first of all, the subject matter was really difficult. It's not the sort of thing that, that politicians are comfortable with. It was really, uh, the sulfur was in the air. What's your take on the coverage to this point of the William Kennedy Smith rape trial? Because it seems to me that in general, the question here is you have certain issues that come up that, or situations that come up that can illuminate issues. Yeah. And so, therefore, we right. are interested in them. But there are also individuals involved right. who have rights and feelings. And yeah. I mean, you've hit on something, I hope, and it's important. First of all, I. I while it's a debatable issue, I really regret that NBC News in the, uh, repeatedly, in the New York Times at least once, has chosen to name the alleged victim because I don't think it advances anything. And I do think that Susan Estrich, uh, you know, who, who was, was herself a rape victim and wrote a book about it, is right that this cannot really help. I know the motive is that it's supposed to destigmatize mm -hmm. the crime, and I, I don't question the motives, but I think it's the wrong judgment. So I might as well get broke on Mike Gardner, angry with me, why not? Um, more generally, I think the, the argument about the press that it's covering this as a reason to throw light on an important social issue is uh, rank hypocrisy. I don't believe it for a minute. They are covering this because it is a, a powerful, rich, controversial family enmeshed in a scandal that has, in one way or another, sex at the center. That's it. That's it. Now, I know what we say. When, when, uh, when Donald and Ivana separate and Nightline covers it, we don't cover that because that's gamey. No, sir, we cover prenuptial agreements and its importance in 20th century uh, America. Not. <laughs> no, not on this one. We're hypocrites. When, when you throw in a thing like not, yeah. which is from Wayne's world and I guess now is into popular usage, it brings up something interesting about you, which is you're a guy who can make a reference to Homie the Clown oh, or time. Wayne's world. You bet or rock music, you bet. which 
which sets you apart to some extent from most of your colleagues. Well, I mean, uh, I'm not saying it's your greatest badge of honor, I but it is an interesting it. Hey, distinction. Listen, uh, it's that I was immersed. I mean, some people, you know, like to talk about, well, I like to study the popular culture because it tells me about America. I grew up as a rock and roll fiend. I went to every Brooklyn Paramount show that I could afford. I, I, my first time I was ever had my, I ever had my picture in the paper, it was in a mob in 1958 trying to get into the New York Paramount for Alan Freed's rock and roll show. I loved the stuff. I grew up on television. Um, the reason I quote Homie the Clown is I think it's one of the funniest characters I've seen on television. In fact, if I may, I was fantasizing. I, I started out as a speechwriter you know, many years ago, and I was thinking if I were writing the acceptance speech for the Democratic candidate, I would work that line in my acceptance speech. I would say... Homie, don't play that? No, no. I would say, and George Bush tells us that economic times have never been better, I don't think so. That would be the <laughs> motif that I would use in that speech, and by the end of it, I would hope, if the speech were good enough, that I'd have the whole crowd chanting it, and two days later, I'd want to see a million buttons saying, I don't think so. I would pick that up as, 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 as the line to kind of... It's, it's, it's readily understandable. It's like Bush using read my lips. It, it's, it's out of the popular culture. It's like, People where's the beef? It. Where's the beef that Mondale did? Absolutely. My thanks to Jeff Greenfield for this return visit. This is even later than people usually see you. This is a whole new constituency for you. Yeah, I usually come up between sermonette and nurses in bondage. So you're even later than that. So, Well, if you have a remote control, it's possible you can see our show and both of those, and then it would be a full night for all of us, Absolutely. wouldn't it? See you later.